and opinions expressed on my story, Living with Lupus Podcast, represents each person's individual experience. By listening to this podcast or reading our blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others. As always, consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. My Story Living with Lucas podcast is officially trademarked, all rights reserved. Thank you for joining me for another episode of My Story, Living with Lupus. I'm your host, Susan Hendricks, and I'm so glad that you could join me on this Friday, December the 20th, 2019. Today, we'll be talking about surprise medical bill and also growing support for a proposed ban on surprise medical bill and also the Trump administration has announced its proposal to have drugs imported over from Canada. That's right. So you know what I want you to do? Grab your cup of coffee grab your cup of tea and for those who are listening late at night you know I appreciate you grab your favorite glass of wine and come on and join the conversation right here on my story living with lupus aquaponics, planting seeds to grow food and creating opportunities for people and families. You can contact this nonprofit organization at www.abundantharvestaquaponics.org. Motivational speaker, entrepreneur, and creator of Right Side of 50, Life Lessons with Sheila Smith. To book her for your next empowerment conference, contact her at rightside50 at gmail.com or call 404 447 Six eight nine seven. Do you understand what surprise medical bill is? I'm going to give you an example. Just say you go to the emergency room and um, you see the ER physician. They draw blood, they do x-rays, they run all sorts of tests, okay? And you think that you have insurance that will cover everything and you won't receive a medical bill. Well, surprise medical billing is when you get that bill in the mail that says, that you owe for the doctor reading your x-ray or that your lab work was sent to an out-of-network laboratory. Okay, so you call the hospital's billing department. And by surprise, they tell you, well, you have to call your insurance company to get it straightened out. 
And in your mind, you think, well, that's what your job is for. And you're correct. That's what the medical billing office of a doctor's office or a hospital should do before a bill is even generated and sent to a patient for the visit. But in the majority of the cases as it is now, that's not what they do. And I'm going to give you an example of myself. I received a medical bill over four from four years ago. I had provided both of my insurances, my primary and secondary insurance. So I placed a call to the hospital billing department and told them, you need to correct this. And they told me no. It was up to me to call the insurance company and see why it was rejected. I said, okay, I'll do that. So I called the insurance company and they told me that they, the hospital, used an incorrect diagnosis. In turn, I called back to the hospital's billing department and spoke to the young lady and I said, you used the wrong diagnosis. And so she asked me, what was the diagnosis that the insurance company stated that they should be using? And so I told her, you're getting paid to do a job. I'm not going to do your job for you. You're putting me in the middle to do your job so that you guys can get paid. I said, no, if you want to know what diagnosis should be used, you either look through the medical chart and rebuild it back with the correct diagnosis, get in contact with the doctor and ask him. What diagnosis did you mean to submit for your services for this individual? And she told me at the billing department at the hospital that they were not allowed to do it. And I told her, I'm not going to do your job for you and get you paid so you could bill me all you want to. The error lies with you to correct. Now, being that I am from the medical community and I used to own a medical billing service and consulting service, this is where the bulk of the money lies Um within a practice or within a facility, when you have individuals who do not know how to work claims to get them paid, who do not know the correct procedures to go through before they automatically send a patient a bill. And let me tell you, I used to get doctors paid. I would tell them, when they say they don't know why the money is not coming in like it should be. I say, you have to look at two people, your office manager and the individual who is doing your billing. Usually the person who's doing the billing doesn't know how to work claims and they throw a rejection in a drawer and just say, forget about it. I'm not going to worry about it. And I told one particular doctor this. I said, have your office manager go through the desk of the individual who 
is doing your medical billing for you. And nine out of 10 times, you will find a bunch of rejections that have not been paid, that can get paid and should be paid. So this particular doctor did that. And they found rejections from over three years ago. And they came to me and said, can you get this back money for me? And I said, yes, but for me to get your money for you, you have to lay my money out first. And that's how I did it. And when Ever physicians had a problem with getting their money in, they would call me to come in and get that back money that was owed to them. You have to look at it this way. You have people that go to these courses for six months And who's ever teaching the courses for medical billing don't truly understand the dynamics of going after a physician or a hospital or a facility's money. So they come out of these courses thinking, oh, I want to bill and make some money. And I tell people who worked for me, you're not going to come in here and mess this doctor's money up. But most importantly, you're not going to mess my money up. If you don't know what you're doing, if you don't have the experience, I will not hire you. And that is is the problem. The majority of the hospitals lose their money from individuals who sit in their billing department and they don't have the experience to go after the money aggressively like they should. They don't know where to look or understand the rejection codes. And I'm not saying that it's bad to go to a school to try to learn a trade because that's all medical billing is. It's a trade. But within that trade, you have to have years of experience. It's things that you look for. And I was the type of person that I could smell fraud before it came up. And I would tell doctors, no, you take this back. I don't want to have anything to do with it because I know that you're doing something wrong and I'm not going to jail for you or no one else. So medical Surprise, should I say, medical billing is, is when you get that surprise medical bill from your doctor's office or facility for something that should have already been taken care of right there in the doctor's office or in the hospital. When we return, I'll go more in depth with surprise medical billing. If you would like to appear on an episode of My Story Living with Lupus, you can contact us at mystorylivingwithlupus at gmail.com. Also visit us on our Instagram page and also our website, My Story Living with Lupus. He is 
with the author of Positive Energy 24-7 and his latest book, It Was Destined, Urban Legend. He's Detroit's own author, Henry Long. To purchase an autographed copy of his book and to purchase his e-book, go to writepath247.com. That's W-R-I-T-E-P-A-T-H 247.com. You can also follow him on Instagram at writepath247. Before we go into more depth discussion about surprise medical bill, let me ask you something. Do you understand your health insurance coverage? Do you realize that if you have blood work drawn and it's drawn by a non-participating lab, it won't be covered. That's the first step we have to go to before we go further in depth with this. You have to understand what your health insurance will cover and won't cover. If it's a participating provider under the network, is it an out-of-network provider? You have to become educated. I've said it so many times. When it comes to dealing with your health care, know before you go into that specialist office, is he or she under your network? If you are in an HMO or a PPO managed health care, um insurance know what is covered and your benefits before you even walk into that office so you won't be surprised with the medical bill now congress is closing in on a deal that could shield patients from Surprise medical bills, eliminating a source of frustration for Americans who face unexpected charges from emergency care and other procedures. The question for the healthcare industry is whether that fix might have broader implications for overall medical prices. The new proposal advanced last week by bipartisan committee leaders would remove patients from disputes among insurance companies, doctors, and hospitals. It would apply in emergencies and other circumstances where patients can avoid bills from physicians who don't accept their insurance. Now, in those situations, patients would have to pay only what they would owe to an in-network provider for the same service. Doctors, hospitals, and health insurers have millions of dollars at stake in how those disputed bills are resolved once patients are taken out of the middle. Now, see, that's why I say you have to have experienced persons in your billing department that know what they're doing to either get the doctor's money, to get the facility's money, or to get the hospital's funds. The proposal moving through Congress would require that health insurers pay at least the median 
in-network market rate for the area. And we know when they say the median um, market rate for your area, some areas will be high and some areas will be low. For those bills above $750, either side could seek to have the conflict resolved by an independent arbitrator if they disagree with the benchmark rate. Removing the ability to bill patients directly could weaken a chief source of leverage that doctors and hospitals have to bargain with insurers over payment rates. Some private equity firms that own doctor staffing companies lobbied against the measures. Certainly, you remove that club and think you'll see some downward pressures on costs, particularly among private equity providers. Any surprise billing legislation to pass Congress this year would likely be attached to spending bills that must be passed by December 20th, 2019. The Trump administration, which endorsed the latest deal, has also pushed for more transparency in hospital prices, an effort that now faces a legal challenge from hospital groups. Some medical industry groups assert that the new bill would allow health insurers to dictate prices. An arbitrary rate gives insurers an incentive to remove hospitals from their networks and force artificially low reimbursement rates, which limit access. Now, emergency care. Medical providers can set their sticker prices as high as they like. Health insurers negotiate discounts from those rates by setting up networks where they steer patients for care. You are a commodity in the medical field. Never forget that you are a commodity who is always for sale. It's sad to say. Now, if a patient goes to a doctor or a hospital that isn't in her insurance network, the provider is free to bill the patient for the full charge. Surprise billing arises when patients have no way to avoid out-of-network charges that can happen after medical emergencies or planned procedures where patients can't choose all their doctors. Even someone going to an in-network surgeon at an in-network hospital might get a bill from an anesthesiologist who is who isn't on the plan, which basically is that the anesthesiologist is out of network. Nationwide, about 16% of inpatient hospital visits trigger bills from out-of-network providers. So know your insurance coverage before you are seen. Personally, I don't think you need an arbitrator to decide. I feel that hospitals and physicians, if you're listening, have you ever thought about doing month-in reports? That tells a lot. Have you ever thought about doing 
year-end reports? Have you ever thought about holding meetings with your billing department managers, your office managers, after you get those reports to sit down and question the person who's doing the billing along with your office manager to see why the figures have gone down. It's simple. Aggressive medical billing. Before anything is done, before the patient comes in to the doctor's office for a visit or a particular procedure at a hospital, verify the insurance. You need to take a lot of the middle people out. It's a way that you guys can recoup your money. It is a way. I just gave you two examples, well, three examples. And my information doesn't come free, but this is a season of giving. And I'm giving you a little hint about how to get your money. If you want to recoup, if your practice um, revenue has fallen to a certain point, check your monthly end reports. Check your year end reports. Have your office manager get together with the ones who are submitting the claims and tell them to bring all of the rejections that they have been hiding out to see how you can recoup that money. It can be done. But personally, I don't think the government needs to put an arbitrator in the middle of this. It's too many hands in the pot. And we know that the patients, the majority of the time, comes out on the losing end. It's all about who you got getting your money. And five, nine out of ten times, they're inexperienced. So that's my Christmas gift. To the medical um, community, doctors, run a month in report. Even if you have billing services that are submitting your claims on behalf of your office, tell them, I want to see a month in report and I want to see that year in report. And that'll tell the story of why your practice is losing money. Now, getting back to this, did you know the U.S. healthcare spending reached $3.6 trillion in 2018, or about 18% of the gross domestic product? That's far higher than other developed countries and economics. Blame outsides spending primarily on higher prices. Though politicians frequently blame insurance companies, but we know insurance companies, along with the pharmaceutical companies, back the politicians. For high health costs, the majority of healthcare spending goes to hospitals, physicians, and other professionals. Those services are purchased in local markets that are often dominated by a small handful of powerful health systems. 
While large employers and national insurers may have a vast buying power across the country, they're often outmatched in any local market by the bargaining power of big hospital systems. Certain medical specialties, including anesthesiologists, pathologists, and emergency physicians have been identified with surprise bills because patients often can't choose these physicians. Those specialties also have among the highest sticker charges. Anesthesiologists charge almost six times what Medicare will pay. And emergency physicians charge four times Medicare rates, according to a 2017 analysis published in JAMA, Family Physicians, whom patients can more easily select, charge 180% of the Medicare rates. Now, curbs on surprise billing might change, and two distinct approaches have emerged as solutions. One was set payments for out-of-network charges based on a benchmark of other existing rates, like a 2017 California law. That approach has faced fierce opposition from hospitals and provider groups. The new proposal in Congress melds elements of the two models. This is sort of between a California model and probably better New York model. So, don't you think that if hospitals, billing department, did their jobs along with physicians, offices, billing departments, did their jobs, there would be a lack of surprise medical billing. Now, I was exposed, and I've talked to the, talked about this before on previous episode of the podcast. I went in to a specialist office, and I was exposed to the active TB virus. I received a letter from the hospital telling me that I was exposed, I was one of the patients exposed to an active TB virus in the doctor's office. Just so happened the doctor had TB. Okay. So they told me to go to my health department or my personal physician to get TB tested. So I took the letter with me to my personal um, physician, primary care physician. He ran a TB test. And all of a sudden, guess what came in the mail? Yes, a bill for the TB test. So I called the billing department of the doctor's office. The doctor is a part of the medical group that I go to. And I told them, I'm not paying flat out. I'm not paying for it. Because for number one, I was exposed in the doctor's office who's a part of your facility. And you want me to pay. I said, I'm not paying. I said, 
You can bill me all you want. It's not like that someone in my family had TB and I was exposed to it. No, the physician who works for your medical group and your hospital had this active TB virus and should not have been working anyway, putting patients' lives in danger. And you think that I'm going to pay for being exposed and having this test? I said, your best bet is you better write it off. And which they did. And I still have the letter in case something happens to me. Now, let me tell you what the Trump administration announced. They announced a proposal to allow drug importation after other efforts to lower drug prices have struck out. Yes, it is a possibility that you may be receiving drugs from Canada. That's right. Washington states will be allowed to import certain FDA-approved drugs from Canada in an attempt to drive down drug costs under a proposed rule issued Wednesday by the Trump administration. Now, no president in history has ever had an FDA willing to open the door to safe importation of drugs from Canada, said Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, on a call with reporters Tuesday from MedPage. And so we're seeking input here. Under the draft rule, interested states independently or in collaboration with wholesalers or pharmacies or other non-federal entities could request to import certain prescription drugs from Canada through written proposal, which would be submitted to the FDA for review and authorization. Eligible prescription drugs would have to be relabeled with the required U.S. labeling prior to importation and undergo testing for authenticity. Now, I can understand lowering the price of drugs. I can understand you wanting to do this, but it is common knowledge that if you import a drug out of another country, will that drug be the same strength or higher? How will it harm the patients? But Alex Azar states that they would do rigorous research and testing to make sure that the patients, the consumers, would not be at risk. That I could not trust. Now, I'm on heart medication. As you know, I don't take anything for my lupus. And this puts a lot of questions in my head, and it should raise a lot of concerns with you guys. If my drug is coming from out of Canada or another country, how is that drug actually being made? And is that facility 
inspected? Does it pass in U.S. inspections? Does it pass FDA's inspections? I just say it. I'm leery of everything when it comes down to what I put in my body. Um, Canadian and American drug systems are very safe, they are stating. Azar further states at a press conference in Florida where he was joined by Governor Ron DeSantis, who has been working on an importation plan for his state. For years, the challenge has been, how could we possibly connect those two systems up in a way that would not allow foreign entities or unauthorized entities to bring adult, adulterated, counterfeit, unimproved products into the closed system, Azar added. That's the whole problem. You would have that coming in. And it's no way that you could tell me that you wouldn't. Something always falls through the crack. And who gets hurt hurt the most? The consumer, the patient. So you can't tell me that. But you can read, excuse me, you can read more about this on MedPage Today. Article written December the 18th, 2019. And to read more about Surprise medical bill moving in Congress. Go to Insurance Journal and read up on that. Don't go into 2020 uneducated about what's going on within the medical community. This is your health. I can lead you to water. But I can't make you drink. Stay with me. I'll be right back. Do you know what the definition of empowerment is? Empowerment is the process of becoming stronger and more confident especially in controlling one's life. Yes, empowerment is increasing the capacity of individuals or groups to make choices about what they want. Yes, empowerment is to transform those choices into desired actions and outcomes. This is my last broadcast for 2019. And I hope that what I've brought to you in 2019 has somehow empowered you to take control of your health care. I don't care what illness you're going through, what life situation you are going through. You have choices. Never let anything stress you out. If by telling my story and everything that I have gone through 
and it's still going through helped someone my job is done see life to me is about what I do in between living how I give back that's what life is all about giving back and helping others I just want to say that I appreciate you all and I don't take anyone for granted you know I received a um, DM (coughs) excuse me from Facebook from from a young lady who told me that she wanted me to know that I inspire her to keep going. She has lupus. And that really touched me. And I said, well, God, I guess I'm doing what you want me to do to show that my test is nothing but a testimony to show the goodness of how God continuously brings me out. And no, I don't take life for granted. (coughs) Excuse me. You see, every day is Christmas for me when I wake up. Every day I cherish my brother Charles, my sister Wanda, my sister Dolores, my daughter Brittany, my nephew Sean, Jeffrey, Courtney, and my great niece who I call Honey. Those are the things I cherish. Yes, I have had things. I have lost things. Yes, this illness has taken its toll on my body. But while I was going through I stood firm on the rock and said, God, I know you're going to see me through this. Through the death scares, I spoke about that. I came out. So become empowered. Start today to be empowered. And no, it is not over until God says it's over. Get up and live your life to the fullest. I appreciate all my listeners from the United States all the way to the Philippines. Thank you. For joining me for the last episode of 2019 of my story, Living with Lupus. I will see you in 2020. I will be appearing on YouTube and Periscope. So if you have not gone over to YouTube, go over to my YouTube page, My Story Living with Lupus, subscribe and like. 
go over to Periscope and subscribe to my Periscope page, Susan L. Hendricks. To all of my individuals, when I say thank you for tuning in and you know what I want you to do, grab that cup of coffee, that cup of tea, and if you're listening late at night, you know that I appreciate you all. Have a safe and blessed Christmas, and I'll see you guys in January for the next episode of my story, Living with Lupus. I'm your host, Susan Hendricks. Happy New Year. and opinions expressed on my story, Living with Lupus Podcast, represents each person's individual experience. By listening to this podcast or reading our blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others. As always, consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. My Story Living with Lupus podcast is officially trademarked, all rights reserved. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.